if you and your spouse got trapped to your chest in quicksand hours away from the closest help, what would you do? As we were all told growing up, quicksand is an unavoidable danger. It's a bigger threat than fire, than muggers, than heart disease. Look around you. Most of you are probably trapped in quicksand right now. If you're these two bickering schmucks, quicksand is also the best marriage counseling that money can't buy. Oh, you heard me correctly. There's just something about that colloidal goop full of debris and dead bodies that really puts those marital squabbles into perspective. Never mind easily escaping a sludge puddle trying to hug you to death. We gotta figure out who's taking out the trash when we get home. Cozy up, nerds. Hop into this mud jacuzzi for the best couples therapy you're ever gonna get from a movie YouTube channel. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the non-Newtonian death hole in quicksand. Picture it. Your marriage has been on the rocks for years as you ignore your partner's desperate need for autonomy and trap them with full-time care of the kids. On a trip to Columbia for a medical conference, you make one last ham-fisted attempt to play nice by embarking on a trek into the rugged mountains near an area even the locals won't visit. But because neither of you are very good at listening, it's going to be the worst hike of your life. Medical doctors Sophia and Josh have reached the unfortunate stage of their relationship where actually being around each other, or even trying to cooperate on something as simple as a botched hotel room, is enough to kick off a fight. They're also in the contrarian stage where they do the exact opposite of what the other says because they said it. So of course, they end up alone on a hiking trail together. But not before the front desk clerk warns them that although the area they're hiking is beautiful and leads to Colombia's highest waterfall, it's also very close to an area called Las Arena which translates to the sands. He tells them the ground is unstable and it's inhabited by snakes. When they don't seem too concerned about it, he signals a thief waiting nearby to follow them. They arrive to find the path itself isn't particularly challenging, but the altitude is a secret killer. At 6,300 feet or 1.9 kilometers, it's high enough to cause altitude sickness in as little as five hours, which wouldn't be a problem on a three hour hike if they weren't about to get trapped up here. Sophia embraces the opportunity to fantasize what her life will be like once her divorce from Josh is finalized by forging ahead down the path without him, losing sight as if she hopes he'll disappear. By the time he catches up, a storm head is formed above them. Josh says they'll have to turn back, but begrudgingly follows him. It isn't long before they reach the parking lot and spot an unexpected visitor. The thief from the hotel is breaking into their truck. Sophie begs Josh to hide until the guy gets what he wants and leaves. But as I mentioned before, the contrarian in them is too dominant now. Like a clueless chuckle fuck of a tourist, Josh ignores her and steps out to confront him. Can I help you with something? Bro, I wouldn't confront someone doing this in my own town, let alone 3,000 miles away in a country where I barely speak the language. And no judgment, but Colombia is especially not a place where this is a bright idea. The thief searches Josh, but when he doesn't find anything, he yells for Sophia to show herself. When she appears, he demands her backpack, and when he bends to inspect it, Josh swings out of nowhere with a WWE move. It's a solid improvisation, except that Josh isn't willing to finish the job, or at the very least, grab the gun before the thief can retaliate, which is exactly what he should be doing. This parking lot is empty. The only way the thief could have known Sophia is there is by following them, probably from the hotel, which means he can't risk us driving back and alerting the police about his racket with the concierge. It's too risky to leave him armed and free to retaliate. Everything after this happens because they don't hit him again. Strip him of that gun, get in their truck, and leave. Instead, they run from him, blindly into a forest as he pursues them, firing wildly through the trees. This is a horrendous idea in any forest, whether it has death holes or not. They manage to stick to the trail for a while, until the storm comes, and they stop to bicker about Josh's terrible decisions. Save that for divorce court, you two. Sophia blames Josh for their mess, and suggests they run into Las Arenas, because the thief probably 
probably won't follow them there. Or how about you walk a tiny bit into Las Arenas, keeping your eyes open for large boulders to duck behind right off the trail, and wait to see if he comes this way. If he doesn't, double back to the truck. Don't disregard local warnings as a nifty cheat code you can exploit for your own gain. They know this land much better than you do. Instead, they bicker so loudly, the thief pops off more warning shots. Sophia bolts off the trail into Las Arenas like a blindfolded triathlete, trying to make up for lost time. She gets turned around within seconds and knocks herself out on a low branch. Even though Josh said he was right behind her, he doesn't find her while she's still unconscious. She wakes, disoriented and bleeding, her vision blurry, and a few steps later... <laughs> The mud pit, or quicksand, is so camouflaged, it's almost invisible until she's neck deep in it. It has non-Newtonian properties, its viscosity changing as pressure is applied to it, meaning that when she tries to raise her arms, it hurts. Josh hears her screaming and swoops in for the rescue. She stops him inches from falling in himself. Unfortunately for both of them, and especially us, Josh is blind as a mole. Sophia is absolutely savable right here, right now, very easily. If he just turns his head to the right about 20 degrees, but we'll get back to that. Josh tells her to hang on while he looks for something to reach her, and returns with the driest, flimsiest, skinniest twig I've ever seen, which breaks the second she grabs onto it, naturally. Can you snap that in your hands, dude? Then it's not strong enough to hold her weight. He should be looking for a young fallen tree, or a dense branch, something he can slide across the entire mud pool and rest on the dry rim. With this, she could hold on to catch her breath, and you can roll it very slowly away as she hangs on, until her body is spread across the surface and not being constricted by the mud's strange properties. He'd have plenty of time to search for this, if they weren't in the most infuriating, contrarian phase of their stupid relationship. He tells Sophia to stay calm and still, so she does this. I almost feel sorry for her. This is like the ultimate 12 year old nightmare. Cartoons and kid movies subliminally fried my brain with fears of quicksand, but you did this to yourself. And I'm not entirely convinced Josh wouldn't be better off without you. We can get one myth about quicksand out of the way right up front to assuage some of your ancient fears. It's physically impossible to sink in quicksand. The density of quicksand is approximately two grams per milliliter. Our frail human forms only run around one gram per milliliter. If you plunged it, the sand would only come up to your waist. So long as you didn't flail wildly for no reason, you wouldn't sink because of those two airbags in your body called lungs, which provide buoyancy. We'll see how easy it is for them to just float there in a few minutes. The danger with quicksand comes from movement. Non-Newtonian goop in this particular situation is basically exhibiting properties of both a solid and a liquid, depending on movement. When you move, initial liquefaction happens but the sand itself becomes more lightly compacted as the water moves into the open space you just made. When Sophia goes under, Josh jumps in too. You see this camera angle right here? It's hiding a very important topographical feature that makes all of this just so dumb after the fact. He pulls her head and shoulders above the mud and she begins breathing again. Funnily enough, that move basically makes Josh a superhero. The force required to move a body part one centimeter per second in quicksand is approximately equal to the force you need to hoist up a car. Of course, it's made a little easier here because all her doom flailing filled the space around her torso with water. With the family now stuck, the mud jacuzzi portion of our marriage therapy can begin. Sophia feels guilty for Josh now being stuck with her too. That's what us in the fake therapy game like to call progress. They spend a few moments talking about what I just said about quicksand before Sophia asks Josh to give her a hand. Literally, they interlace their fingers and she tries to lift her arm out of the mud. She doesn't listen to recommendations or his attempts to coax it out more gently and they fail. Hey, brain how about you have Josh gently dig out the mud on top of your arm so you can lift it more easily? Instead, Sophia plunges her hand deeper into the muck to try and take her shoe off. She feels something, and together, they heave a third player into their game. <laughs> 
it might seem like if they can haul this guy out, they can get themselves out too. But thanks to an early unnecessary scene, we know this body's been in here for about a week. I couldn't find much on fresh bog body densities, but by that point, microbes start to eat our flesh and fart out things like hydrogen sulfide and methane, which decrease its density. Because these two are doctors, they diagnose him with a case of starved to death itis. Along with the corpse, they find a backpack with a flashlight, a lighter, some mints, a knife, and a shotgun with two shells inside. Sophia says she can't stand seeing him, and they shove him back under. I'd love to tell you they could use his stiff rigor mortis ass to get out of this, but after a week in the tank, he'd be floppy again. So, best to hide that that sin back in the bog. Josh tells Sophia their only way out is to cut up the backpack and lasso a nearby tree stump. But the second she hears she'll have to do it, she wusses out like the little complainer she is. Back at the hotel, their one friend, Marcos, realizes they might be missing when he spots the thief walking through the lobby with Josh's backpack and blood smeared across his shirt. Now that is what I call unprofessional. You didn't even stop to change first? Marcos makes a scene, but successfully tackles the guy to the floor while in hotel lockup. Seriously, this hotel has a dungeon. The thief tells Marcos that his friends wandered into Las Arenas. A lucky break if he weren't trapped in a cell. Back in the pit, Sophia and Josh bond over old times as she tries to lasso the stump and realizes they'll need another eight feet of rope to make it. Josh offers his jacket, but they both know it won't be enough. Suddenly, sounds of a helicopter reach them. It's flying low, likely used for tourism, but there's no way to signal them through the heavy trees. Using the gunshots sounds like a solid idea, but I'd bet it'd make the helicopter fly away faster rather than stop to see who's shooting at it. Of course, they'd probably call it in, but there's no telling if someone would be smart enough to realize it's an SOS in time. Sophia panics and tries to set a Bible they found in the backpack on fire, but it takes Josh basically weeping at her to get her to listen when he says it's waterlogged and a flame could compromise the lasso. Stress is an unhealthy strain on the best of marriages, but the biggest problem, especially when life is on the line, is toxic communication. You can't fix a broken relationship without talking it out, let alone rely on each other for survival. And Sophia is the worst at this. Remember, it's you two against the problem, not you against each other. A few minutes later, Sophia starts a new argument about not having any food or water. I mean, you might not have food, but you definitely have water. Water. Sure, it's probably full of worms and parasites. You'll need to get flushed out of your system in a hospital. But it beats dehydrating like a mummy, I guess. To collect the water, we just need to bring our hand up in front of us, cup it, and press it to the surface of the mud, like we're trying to skim gross foam off boiling potatoes. Very slowly press, wiggle it a tiny bit, and water will eventually separate from the mud into your hand. Suddenly, Sophia screams. Something is biting her. Bullet ants have crawled across the mud and dug into her exposed back and neck. Let's fucking swipe them away, swipe them away, swipe them away. Fuck... Bullet ants are rated the highest pain level possible on the Schmidt Sting Pain Index. He describes this insect's sting as, quote, pure, Intense, brilliant pain. Like walking over flaming charcoal with a three inch nail embedded in your heel. Its venom contains a paralyzing ponerotoxin. With their limited mobility, she begs for help and Josh whips out an entire bottle of vodka he had stashed in his underwear. Sophia wastes all of it, drowning the sting. Unable to stop herself from pouring, costing them a potentially vital sterilizing agent. Afterward, instead of thanking him, she chastises him for having vodka put no food. The food was in the backpack, you ungrateful skag. He mentions he's miserable in the divorce, and she says it would have been better if they were strangers. Yes, salt that wound. They start to bicker over using the gun to extend their lasso when something hisses nearby. The internet has failed me again when it comes to snake identification, just like it did in the ledge. It looks like a python and constricts like one, but spoiler, it's about to attack and this snake is venomous, which a python is not. A lot of viewers suggested it's a bushmaster, which is both a constrictor and venomous. It's also found in Colombia, so we're going with that. Either way, the way to handle this is the same. Don't give it time to attack. Toss the backpack over its head, smash it with the rifle, and shove it 
it down into the mud to drown it. It'll take a few minutes, but once it's gone cold, it'll give you the extra eight feet you need for your lasso. Instead, Sophia goes for the gun, angering it into springing for Josh's arm. <laughs> Could have fixed your food shortage too, but whatever. She ties a useless tourniquet and Josh begins to self-diagnose, saying his organs will start to fail and he'll be in a world of pain before he dies. Sophia counters, he has at least six hours still. That's if he slows his heart rate and calms the f down so the venom spreads slower. But again, contrarian. Now that she's told him to chill, he begins waving his fist at the heavens. Not literally, it's trapped in mud and ranting about the unfair randomness of it all. Well, at least you can use his rigor mortis ass as a stiff branch to climb out after he dies. They make a little more progress as they both get the blame game out of the way and apologize to each other before Josh begins to free. Sophia sees something peeking out of the collar of his shirt. Josh has been body snatched. Just kidding, it's a massive stroke causing blood clot. Sophia takes the dirty muddy knife and sterilizes it with a lighter to cut the clot out. <laughs> Forbidden Jello. She yanks it out like a parasitic gack, then cauterizes the wound with a hot knife. Is it just me, or does she look a little too excited about this? Afterward, they both pass out for an undisclosed amount of time. When they wake, it's still daylight. Josh is doing better, and he tells her he loves her. Aw, mud marriage counseling to the rescue. Not literally though, because they're just floating here. Eventually, it dawns on Sophia that the snake would make an excellent extension cord. She reasons that the snake must still be nearby because one of her eggs fell onto the surface of the mud pit. I mean, you did shoot it earlier, so it's probably dead. Definitely not worth banking on. The dead body's magic inventory comes to the rescue again. Using binoculars, she spots the snake and begins hurling all the non-essential bits and pieces at it until she annoys it enough to come closer. She grabs the gun and readies to fire, but the snake's seen this movie before and jump scares her from behind. She fires her last shot and it goes wild. Wide, right before the snake sinks its teeth into her arm. It winds around her like a vice. She grabs a hold of its neck and Josh wakes up just long enough to save her. With the snake now part of her rope, she summons her last strength and lassos the stump. She pulls herself off the mud with her body surface spread out and staggers. Her lower limbs weak and numb from the pressure of the mud. Wiggle your big toe, Sophia. Josh is too in and out of consciousness to reach for her when she tries to grab him. So she leaves him behind. You loyal viewers know the problem before I even say it. She has no idea where she is. Sunlight is fading and there's no trail here to follow. She stumbles around randomly, almost falling in another mud pit because she didn't learn her lesson the first time. Hours later, well after dark, she's still wandering in no particular direction, exhausted, hungry, and numb. She collapses. And in the Christmasiest of Christmas miracles, Marcos and his merry band of emergency personnel actually find her and save Josh too. Well, great. I give their marriage another five months. As for surviving this, let's strip away the false sense of security this ending brings. No friends are coming to save them, because even if they knew where they were, it'd be like finding an annoying needle in a haystack. And no, we don't luck into a dungeon skeleton's inventory. Our rescue happened 10 seconds after Sophia fell in that pit. We're looking for a heavy branch, not some flimsy twig. Or we're taking off our jacket and swinging it out to her to hold on to for the illusion of safety. While we test the perimeter of the mud pit and see where the hard soil ends and soft mud begins, this simple act of physical testing the perimeter will save Sophia in 10 minutes flat. Why? Because we get a whole bunch of views of this mud pit, its shape and their locations change throughout. But Sophia didn't fall into the center of the pool. She fell closer to the edge, as seen in this shot. In fact, there's a bunch of shots that suggest there's a pit edge right behind her, almost within reach. Now, I'm not saying you or I would fall this way, but I am saying that the obvious place to try and pull her out of the mud is from the closest edge. Making a show of giving her our coat, then walking around looking for that edge might have kept her from flailing in panic. And we could have reached her, even if we couldn't find a bigger branch. With our hands wrapped around her wrists, tell her to gently wriggle her legs back and forth to create space for water to flow in and loosen the mud as we slowly extract her. Now, let's say we're both stuck. Then the best way to get out would still be to wiggle with a bit more caution. Force your arms above the mud line. 
lean back slowly, doing a very gentle tiny wiggle movement to help keep the sand loose around you until your upper half is resting on top of the mud. Just like they talked about earlier, distributing your weight more will help you keep afloat, so to speak. Reach back and feel for solid ground. It's okay if you can't fully grab on yet. In this position, gently wiggle your lower legs, and I mean gently. Think the bride in Kill Bill forcing her body to work again gently. Bring your lower legs slowly to the surface until your entire body is out. Roll over and pull yourself over the ledge. Escaping quicksand is a lot like a healthy marriage. Don't wallow in the muck, bitching and moaning and flailing, and you'll probably pull yourself out of any bumpy parts and pits together. For those reasons, I think quicksand was beaten. Sink or swim, the choice is yours.